Welcome to this week's briefing. We're going to consider the implications of two rather more upbeat developments as far as the global economy is concerned in this session. In the last few hours in Brussels came the announcement that there had been a solution of a sort hammered together as far as the uh, euro area sovereign debt crisis is concerned. And just an hour or so ago we had the growth figure for Q3 in the United States which came in at 2.5%, a strong figure after the weak performance of the previous quarter at something like 1.3%. So I'm going to unpick some of these developments with my colleague Tom Wales. And Tom, let's first of all start with this Q3 figure and unpack that a little bit. What accounts for this uh, surprisingly strong performance given it was a period of political gloom and a lot of naysaying? Well, there was a lot of um, a, an extraordinarily negative market reaction and uh, reaction in terms of consumer sentiment after the debt ceiling fiasco and S&P downgrade yeah. of uh, U.S. sovereign debt um, at uh, the beginning of August. Um, and then accompanied by fears about what was going on in Europe, uh, there was a really negative period for equities uh, right at the beginning of that period. It was actually in a, a sort of uh, amazingly strong rally in bonds, which uh, yes. as well, which, uh, you know, represented a kind of flight to safety. It wrong-footed a lot of people like uh, Bill Gross at Pim PIMCO and, uh, and many other market players. But um, the fact is that um, the fundamentals out of uh, the United States have been fairly strong for a while. Uh, I mean, one of the most striking things is despite this sort of massive, uh, very negative plunge in consumer confidence, retail sales, uh, at least uh, through September, have held up very well. Yeah. Uh, likewise, uh, trade has been a net plus, particularly goods, the goods trade uh, uh, and uh, U.S. exports uh, have been fairly solid. A lot of that is attributable to, to China, China and Chinese growth as opposed to Europe. So, uh, you know, overall, the picture is pretty good. I, I actually think that the job market is also in pretty decent shape uh, in the United States. Are going to see some, a lot of new hires when the next figures come out? I don't think you, you'll see a tremendous lot of new hires, but I think we'll see a, a figure above, uh, well above 100,000, maybe, maybe closer to 200,000, but certainly above 100,000 uh, net for October when those figures are reported at the end of next week. Okay. Also, unemployment's going to fall. Some of the high-frequency indicators that we look at, Gallup and elsewhere, show that basically uh, jobs are, are not quite as hard to get as they were, although the, the overall state of the job market is, is pretty Let's push poor. it forward a little bit um, into Q4 and what the outlook's like there, and perhaps begin by wondering whether what's happened in Brussels over the last few hours is going to lift the outlook as far as U.S. Q4 is concerned. I think it may help a little bit when it comes to business confidence, and it'll certainly, I mean, we've already seen the positive reaction on financial markets, but it, it, the main effect will be indirect on business confidence. I don't think that, I think the outlook, our outlook for growth in Europe is pretty poor overall, you know, with the possible exception of kind of weak growth in Europe and other countries, it's looking like potential double dip territory and certainly the job market in, in countries, including this one, the UK, is, is, is the outlook is bad. A lot of consumer spending traditionally in the US in the last quarter. Well, I think that you know, I, I think actually the market will probably hold up there okay. I mean, I, I think if uh, if we see consumer confidence start to recover as people realize that the sky isn't falling and wasn't falling, uh, as, as you would have known if you'd read the Daily Brief, uh, we, we'd see a bit of uh, firmness there. I don't think we'll see any major lift, but more firmness. What worries me slightly are, are you know, other exogenous risks, slower growth in the developing world. That could be a bit of a problem, but, you know, what we're what we also need to see really to ensure firm growth in the fourth quarter is constructive action by policymakers. We're kind of dubious that the we're well we don't think the the super committee is is going to come up with a, a real long-term plan for fiscal consolidation but we think that one or two bits of the Obama jobs plan certainly not the whole thing which has already been defeated twice but Little bits of the Obama jobs plan, including an expansion of payroll tax cut, payroll tax cuts, extension and expansion, a couple other incentives for for business investment. Okay. 
we're hoping that those can go through. And if that happens, you know, the fourth quarter will, it's not going to be tremendously strong, but we could see growth in the sort of 2% range, maybe a little stronger like this quarter. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's not bad. So let's turn to some of the political implications of this economic story with regard both to what's going on in the Republican Party and the Occupy Wall Street movement. Well, on the Republican side, uh, there's a, a kind of fascinating little two-person race going on for the, the presidential nomination between uh, Mitt Romney and, and Rick Perry, the, the current governor of Texas. Uh, these are the only two candidates uh, you really need to worry about. Uh, it's basically Romney's advantage in, elect in electability versus Cain or uh, Perry's advantage uh, among uh, conservatives. Herman Cain's currently at the top of the national polls. So what? He can't win. Um, on, in terms of Occupy Wall Street, this has gotten a lot of attention uh, from a lot of our clients, particularly in the financial sector, not least because these people are close to a lot of their headquarters in, mm -hmm. in New York, although you know a lot of financial firms have now moved uptown, but whatever. The, uh, we think fundamentally this is a bit of a challenge for the Democratic Party uh, in terms of of turning out youth and attracting the same amount of youth support that they had in, in 2008 uh, for the president. But uh, in terms of the policy impact of the Occupy Wall Street movement, I think very little, unless it gets a lot bigger, a lot, a lot more quickly, and that's not going to happen. Where we've seen sort of headline uh, sort of uh, violence or, or kind of, um, you know, confrontations with police, like in Oakland, that really has very little to do with the national scene and a lot more to do with the, the sort of problems between uh, the citizenry and the, poli and the police in Oakland, uh, which is, has been a, a sort of a feature for a while. So it's not quite as big as it appears in the media. If you actually want to go down and look at the alt uh, Occupy Wall Street protests, the biggest one in New York, you'll find it's actually not that big. Tom, thanks very much. That's it for this week. If you have any questions about our analysis or our advisory work and how it can help you as you encounter the challenges of a fast-moving geopolitical world, then please do get in touch with us.